Amen? Amen. All right, let's prepare for our, our, today's message by first turning over to what Ephesians 4.22 tells us. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being con- corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which is, is, is in the likeness of God, which God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. And that's what we're here to do this morning. Listen to truth, real truth. Forget about the lies. Let us focus on the truth, and let's take that moment of silent prayer this morning, please. Father, thank you once again for giving us another opportunity to gather together, Father, as your children here in Somerset, Massachusetts, face-to-face, Father, and also throughout the world through the technology that you've made available for us, Father. We ask once again that you bless the time that we have together and the message that you have for us, Father, today. And we are grateful for the people that you put in place to prepare those messages and that they trust in you, Father, to deliver it to us. So we ask once again that you bless the time and the message that we're about to receive today, Father. And we ask these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We should all get ready for some more exciting principles and the brand new things to come. And now, here is my father, Pastor Robert McLaughlin. Thank you. I called her my dear because she's my dear daughter. That was very, very interesting, very <laughs> well done. I cannot believe you did that. Yeah. I'll tell you, I, I just can't believe you did it the way you did it. Thank you. you need to be congratulated on that. Let me tell you something. Originally, if you folks remember, for those who do remember, we used to have men open up here and they were supposed to do a synopsis. And a lot of times it turned, it went from a synopsis, which is a, it should have been a, um, a, re- a revelation or it should have been a description of what we studied that week. And it turned into the fact that men would get up here and they'd maybe switch it a little bit and tell us what they learned or something else. But we hardly had someone that did it like it should be done. And what it should be done, it, what you just heard, is what it, the way it should have been done. She actually gave a description of what we studied this past week. And she gave it in a very, very difficult way. Because first of all, being a woman up here and uh, being ridiculed, which she is being ridiculed because she's now taking over the ministry, according to some goo-goos here. And uh, I'm supposed to be lost or something. But this is my daughter. She's not taking over anything. She's my daughter. She's up here because I want her up here. And if you have a problem with that, I told you before, there's the doors. You can leave any time. And she did an amazing job. And I'm very proud of her. And uh, I'm not going to apologize for her. I'm going to compliment her because she did it the way it should have been done. And uh, I'm very happy the way that she actually uh, gave you an uh, introduction to what we're going to note, because it is a very difficult doctrine to teach, let alone get up here in front of a congregation that uh, basically, I'm I'm still sad to hear that I still got people there that think that this is a game or uh, we shouldn't have her up here because she's a woman or they're taking over the ministry, the Madeiruses and taking over my ministry, I'm senile. I don't know what I don't know what to do. All I can say is the Bible says do all things without murmuring and complaining. Philippians 2 verse 14. And maybe you should practice that if that's her attitude because you're here for the wrong reason. So you did an amazing job and I'm going to give you a round of applause myself. Thank you, my daughter. <clears throat> okay, once again, we begin this morning with some of the blessings that she actually told us. And uh, we're going to begin with, uh, this morning with some of the blessings and accomplishments that our Lord's ascension, his descension, when he descended into he- uh, he- hell, because he had to go down to get the Old Testament saints, and the new doctrine, the session, were about to be mentioned and supplied by our Lord's victories upon the cross. Did I tell you to turn to First Peter chapter 1? 
Turn to First Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> because this is a reference to our Lord's ascension into heaven following his resurrection, his position at the right hand of God the Father. And when he arrived in heaven, he heard those magical words, by the way, which were quoted from Psalm 110, as she mentioned, Matthew 22, 44. These are quoted in the Old Testament and the New. Uh, Mark 12, 36, Luke 20, verse 42, Acts 2, 34 through 35, and Hebrews 10, 12 through 14. So I want you to remember those particular scriptures because I'm not going to give them all the time, but they're very important in our subject. Psalm 110.1 is the first time David said, the Lord, Jehovah, said to my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. It was David that first said that in Psalm 110.1. Our Lord thought it was so important. He said it in Matthew 22.44, Mark 12.36, Luke 20. Uh, verse 42. The early apostles did it in the book of Acts. And uh, they said they all did it. They, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who it was, but they said, the individual, he said, actually said, sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. A very important principle because this is a passage that describes the doctrine of the session, which is that doctrine of Christology, which means it's about Jesus Christ, that pertains not to the glorification of our Lord's, of our Lord's deity, but the glorification of our Lord's humanity at the right hand of God the Father. Remember, at the right hand of God the Father is a member of the human race who actually represents you. And speaking of you and being represented, I believe it's your birthday, Mr. Uh, O'Brien. Is today your birthday, Mr. Mr. O'Brien? Bob, is today your birthday? John Forsythe. Is today your birthday, Bob? Sure. Oh, you, February 3rd. John, John Forsythe, is your birthday? That's good. Uh, good. Happy birthday. Guess who else's birthday it is? It's someone on stage's birthday. I won't tell you yet. <clears throat> What's that? That we had told, uh, yeah, well, there's the, the gambler here. It's his birthday. I won't tell you who he is. It's his birthday. Everybody, everybody must have had parents that fooled around the same month because there's a lot of birthdays here. I got two more in the back. It's their birthdays. My grandson's Bryson's birthday. birthday. Bryson's birthday. Bryson, happy birthday, Bryson. It's Bryson's birthday. It's really Bryson's birthday? Uh, Bryson, you have us had a good time last night. You're coming on your birthday. You got sunglasses on. What's her name? Well, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Don't want to say that. We got a lot of people that have a birthday today, but there's someone on stage that has the birthday too. And I'm going to tell you who he is, but it's not me. As you know, I'm senile. I don't have birthdays anymore. But anyway, when our Lord actually just went to heaven, this doctrine of the session is that doctrine that pertains to everything about him, to the glorification of our Lord's humanity at the right hand of God the Father. For when our Lord received that title, when our Lord received the title that he did to sit down at the right hand of God, he was beginning to experience the ultimate glory of everything he could ever imagine that was about to happen to him. He did not know because in his humanity, he was actually uh, learning things as well. You got to remember being seated at the right hand of God is a member of the human race that you and I are in union with, with right now. He, we have a member of the human race, Jesus Christ, who's seated at the right hand of God. And the Bible says every one of you are seated with him in the plan of God in Ephesians 2, verse 6. And so when he actually received that title, that's why the angels actually were rejoicing with him. And they will not have the ultimate rejoice until we get into another doctrine that's about to follow this one as well. But these particular principles principles come from individual doctrines like things that were said in the Bible that I've quoted for years and you've heard for years like 1 Corinthians 2 9 things which eye has not seen even the Lord learned this things which the eye has not seen things which the ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who do what those who what 
love him. Not for those who are saved, but for those who love him. If you love him, God has many blessings for you that he has prepared just for you because of your love for him and his son, 1 Corinthians 2.9. But you know who actually is impressed by these and uh, these particular principles and we, are over, we overlook them a lot? It's the angels. There's a lot of things that happen in the eternal realm, in the angelic realm especially, where we miss out on what the angels are doing because the angels tell us a lot. They're limited even though they were in heaven and they saw the Son of God, but they didn't see him in his humanity, but they saw what heaven was and what heaven was all about and all those things. Even though he, he would, they were in heaven, they still were learning. And so I want you to look at 1 Peter 1, verse 12. Notice what it says. It was revealed to them. To who? To those, those angels, also to the Old Testament saints, that they were not serving themselves, but you. By the way, this is really talking about the angels. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.14 that you have received a, an angel. It's called your guardian angel whose role it is to guard you, to protect you from Satan, from condemnation, from guilt, from all the lies that are out there to try to destroy your momentum and your love for God. And so it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. It includes the Old Testament saints. Saints, but even you in these things, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel, the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which who longs to look at. The angels long to look. Even the angels, in fact, the Greek word there is they have like a rubber neck. The angels are learning from us. The Bible says, be careful how you live. You know why? It says in Ephesians 3, verse 10, that the angels are learning from you what it's all about, what the plan of God is all about, what the humanity of Christ is all about. Who's learning that? The angels are. The angels, just because they walked with him and they talked with him, don't know him better than we do. That's just something that we conclude based upon sight. But these are things into which angels even long to look at. What a privilege. We're told in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that if you are someone who loves God, there's going to come a time when each one may be what? Recompense. This is not salvation. This is rewarded. This is paid back for your deeds, not your sins. Each one may be recompensed for his deeds, his good deeds that he done, that did in his body according to what he has done, whether they were good, divine good is the word, or whether they were evil, bad. And that means they were done with the sin nature rather than the divine nature. So 1 Corinthians 3.14 is another one that's quoted that we overlook many times. It will also be a time when winner believers shall receive a reward. Think about that. When we go to heaven and we see the uh, Son of God seated at the right hand of God, he's going to be waiting for us. He's going to be waiting just for some of you. He's going to be waiting to say, say to some of you, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and you're going to be rewarded as a winner believer because of your faithfulness to him in time. And as people may mock you right now and they may mock your dedication to him, you just keep your eyes right straight where they are going or where they are right now. For many of you have been passing the test that God has brought and God is bringing. And you know the kind of nation we're under right now. You know the problems that we have as a nation. You know our role in pray, praying for the leaders. And many of you have seen through that and you have realizing why you were here. And you're going to be rewarded for that. Why? Because you became a winner believer. You did not let the guilt and the condemnation that comes from the cosmic system drag you down. And that's also going to be a time when 2 Corinthians 5.10 is going to be rewarded, which says that each one may be recompensed for deeds in the body. So the point is that the doctrine of the session is that doctrine of Christology. It pertains to the glorification of our Lord's humanity at the right hand of God. It's also going to be a time that if the Lord Jesus Christ remained on earth, he would have had a limited glory. But when he went to the third heaven, he became superior to all creation. And therefore, he received an unlimited amount of glory. Why? Because God always, re God always rewards his people. And by the way, some of you wives are going to be rewarded for the fact that you gave up your husband so that they could do the work of God. Some of you husbands will be rewarded because your wives are doing the same thing. There's a, there's a reward for that. And if you have the privilege of ever being 
becoming a part of the third witness where your marriage brings glory to God because both of you have been serving God and loving God. You now have become a unique individual because very few individuals ever reach the third witness status. And therefore, it's interesting that the word that we have is used for the mind when he says, if you want to love the Lord. Look at Colossians chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. I want you to see something very interesting. I want you to see how the Apostle Paul put it. Beginning with Colossians 3, verse 1. <clears throat> How's everyone doing today? That's good to hear. We've got a snowstorm, I think, coming. I don't know. It says it's coming. And uh, we'll see what happens. I'm just so glad to be alive, and I'm so glad to be healthy, and I'm glad we have a congregation like we do, and I'm glad we're going to go forward in the plan of God and not let anything stop us. Amen? Amen. That's the way it should be. Paul said this, beginning in Colossians 3.1, If then you have been raised up with Christ. Have you been raised up with Christ? Of course you have. When he was raised from the dead, you died with him. You also were raised with him. And he says this, keep seeking. If you have been raised up with Christ, you do this. Keep seeking. Keep seeking what? The things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And then he writes this, a very interesting thing that you don't see in the English. He says, set your what? Your mind on things above. Do not set your mind on things that are on the earth. Why do I say that's interesting? Because the word mind is very interesting because of the fact that we're going to see, where is it? Um, I don't know if I have it. I thought I had it. Is it? Oh, there it is. The word used, thank you, Samantha, helping your dad there again. It's interesting that the word for mind here is the present active imperative. The present tense means you're doing it consistently. The active voice, you're making your own decisions to do it. The imperative mood is the command, but the verb is not to set your mind, your, your thinking on him. The word is phroneo, P-H-R-O-N-E-O. It's a word for loving him with affection. So when it says, set your mind on things above, it says, set your mind, set your affection, your love for him on things above. Love him with phroneo, not with your thoughts, not with your mind, but having that personal love, that love with affection that you have for Christ. Why? Because you realize everything he's done for you. And because, and look at verse 3, because you have died. You've died in your life. You have a life. But your life is what? Hidden with Christ in God. Now, how can your life be hidden with Christ in God if you're here this morning, right now, here, face to face, watching me or listening to the word of God? Because that's what we call your position in Christ. Right now, we all have the same position. We're loving him because we're setting our mind on things above. We have died. Our life is hidden. But it's, we're hidden with who? With Jesus Christ in God. And therefore, when Christ who is our life, and he is our life, is revealed, rapture of the church, then you also will be revealed with him, you especially the winner believer, will be revealed with him in glory. And this reveals the fact that upon re arrival in the third heaven, our Lord was seated at the right hand of God the Father. And that's one of the many blessings of what we call the doctrine of the session. That's when he received his third royal title that my daughter brought out. Just great job there, Sam. When she said, you know the title King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Bright and Morning Star? That's a title of our Lord. He's He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the bright and morning star. And if you realize this was that time that the human race was elevated higher than the entire angelic creation in Hebrews 1.14 and Hebrews 2.7 and Psalm 8, then you realize all the blessings of the session. Now go to Colossians chapter 2. You're in chapter 3, right? Look at chapter 2. Look at verse 1. I want you to see what Paul says here. And notice I'm quoting scripture again. He says this to the Colossian church. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf. Who? Who's he talking to? For, especially for those who are at Laodicea. Who's at Laodicea? At Laodicea is one of the seven churches. In fact, it's the worst church of all the seven. It's called the Laodicean church. It's the lukewarm church in Revelation 3, beginning with verse 14 all the way to verse 22. So he's talking about individuals who are loser believers who are at Laodicea. 
And Paul says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf because you love them. And for those who are at Laodicea because they're lukewarm. And for all those who have not personally seen my face, here's proof that there was a time that Paul taught people and he didn't teach them face to face. They didn't have that opportunity at that privilege at the time. And he says this, I want that their hearts may be what? Encouraged. How? Having been knit together by means of impersonal, unconditional love. Not love, but impersonal, meaning you're loving them because of who you are. Unconditional, no conditions attached. And then you have that virtue love. And so he says that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together by means of impersonal, unconditional love and attaining to all the wealth, the word wealth means riches, that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting from a true knowledge, or the word is epinosis, resulting from metabolized doctrine of God's what? God's mystery. That is the doctrine of the mystery of Christ himself, by the way, in whom are hidden all the what? the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Please notice the word treasure. And I'll give you that word because of the Greek once again. It's the Greek noun thesaurus. Now everybody knows what a thesaurus is. It's a book that gives you other words to use, other descriptions. Here it means a treasure chest. That when you approach the Lord and you realize who he is, in him are hidden all the what? The treasures. Just the, the, the fact that he's got treasures in him. What are those treasures? They're many. We don't know them all. We're learning about them. We're going to learn more and more about them. Even through eternity, we'll be learning more and more. We'll never catch up to God. And people will say, what are we, what are we going to be doing in heaven? We're going to keep on learning about him. And when you, get, get, you go from Genesis to Revelation and you finish the whole book, he's going to say, okay, back to Genesis 1-1 again. And we start all over. And we're going to learn about him. We're never going to catch up. But he's going to keep on being a thesaurus chest to us. Almost anything, just like the English word is used here, to describe that anything can be used, uh, has a, a great meaning that the Lord has when he has this what? The treasures of what? Wisdom and knowledge. I say this, he says in verse 4, because I don't want anyone to deceive you. Delude you means to deceive you with a persuasive argument. There's a lot of people that can deceive us with persuasive arguments. You know, well, I believe this and I believe that. Where's your proof? Where's your fruit? Where's your doctrine? Where's the fact that you, you say you believe something, but you don't have anything to back up what you believe? And then he says in verse 5, For even though I am absent in body, Nevertheless, I am with you in spirit. Notice again, he's not with them in his physical body, but he's with them in spirit. He's rejoicing to see your good discipline, he says, and the stability of your faith or your doctrine in Christ. Therefore, in Colossians 2, 6, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord yourselves, how did you receive the Lord Jesus Christ in Ephesians 2, 8? By grace, through faith, not of works, so what are you to do? Walk in him by means of what? Grace, by grace, through faith, not of works. Let me repeat that. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord yourselves, that's your salvation, Ephesians 2, 8, by means of grace, through faith, not of yourselves, so walk in him by means of the same principle, by grace, through faith, in other words, it's the same way you were saved, the same way you live. Having been firmly rooted, and now you're being built up, and you're being established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and you're overflowing with what? Gratitude. Now, according to Psalm 8, which I want you to go to right now, originally you have to know something about man. Man was originally, when God created the angels, man was created, I mean, the angels were created higher than the, higher than the uh, human race. Originally, Psalm 8 tells us man was created higher than the animal creation, but lower than the angels. Again, man was created higher than the animal creation. When God created the human race, what did he say? Rule over them. He, and he said, you rule, be, have, have rulership over the world, and they lost that rulership. Well, you know what? God did something fantastic beginning in Psalm 8. So go back to Psalm 8. Let's let the word of God speak to us in verse 1. Psalm 8, verse 1. John, you can take these <clears throat> before I do something wrong. Look at verse 1. 
for the choir director. This is David now. He's the writer of music, by the way, on the Gittit. It's, uh, by the way, that's the up, up-to-date guitar. A Psalm of David, Song of David, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who has displayed thy splendor above the heavens? From the mouth of infants, notice this, and nursing babes, you've established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful, revengeful what cease. When I consider the heavens, the writer says, David, when I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, I think about this. What is man? What are we? that you even take thought of him. What do we think we are, by the way, that God even takes thought of us? And the Son of Man, that you even just care for him. For you have made him a little, you notice this, yet thou has made him a little lower than God, or the gods, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You do make him to rule over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our God, our Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So I want you to think about that. Originally, that's the creation where God created the angels above the human race. Now, when our Lord arrived in heaven as a member of the human race, he was rewarded by God the Father for what we call his strategic and tactical victory in the angelic conflict. God said, you have victory. Where did, you, where did he get that victory from? Colossians 2, 14 and 15 says, his victory came from the cross. At the cross, he died for the sins of who? The entire human race. And because of that, God rewarded him with a strategic and tactical victory blessing in the angelic conflict. And what was that reward? We're going to see it. It was a brand new title for a brand new strategic victory. And that brand new title, by the way, he did not possess before he became a member of the human race is the King of Kings. It's something new. He was not, he was, he was not the King of Kings in the Old Testament. He was not the Lord of Lords, the bright morning star. By the way, who are the kings that he's gonna be kings over? It can't be the entire human race. There'd be no king. I mean, everybody would be a king. The kings are winner believers. The Lord of Lords, the Lords are winner believers. He's the King of all kings, the winners. He's the Lord of all the Lords, the winners. He's the bright and morning star, the title that Satan wanted from him. It's the greatest title God could ever have. Jesus Christ now is the bright and morning star, and he shares that with only one group of people called the Ecclesia, not the royal family, but the church, the called out ones, the ecclesias. That was his third, what we call royal title. A brand new title, by the way. A brand new title that was made of royalty. And his two, first two titles, as my daughter brought out, well, the first one was the son of God. So as the son of God, he had to have a family. His family is, the royal family is for him, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. They are, the, they are the related to the Son. He's the Son of God, and therefore his royal family is the Father and the Holy Spirit, so that all three members of his royal family were God or deity. His second title is called the Son of David. His royal family was made up of just Jews, not, not Gentiles, but Jews or those who actually converted to the Jewish religion or the Davidic dynasty, and so he's called the son of David. And as the son of David, what did he have? He had to have a brand new uh, family. And uh, how he had, because yeah, that brand new family is going to be, of course, the fact that he was the son of David, and therefore the brand new family would be the Jewish people. But however, his third royal title was actually uh, the royal title we're going to see the age of Israel had to be halted. It had to be stopped or paused. The church age was inserted for the calling out of his third royal family called the Ecclesia or the royal family, 1 Peter 2. Go to 1 Peter 2, look at verse 9 because here's where we get royal family. But he didn't have a royal, he, see, he's, a, he's the leader of a royal family, but he doesn't have a family yet. So God says, I'm gonna give him a third family. And that third family is going to be made up of royalty. First Peter 2, look at verse 9. But you are a chosen race. Do you believe that this morning? 
Do you believe that all of you, in spite of what people may think about you or what you think about yourself, that you are a chosen race, that you've been made a chosen race, a royal priesthood, that you're a holy nation, that you're, you all are a people for God's own possession so that you can proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous what? His marvelous light? Think about that. However, there would be a fantastic change that had to be made from David's Psalms in the book of Hebrews. For example, go to Hebrews 2 for a moment. Look at verse 6. I want you to remember this now because now we're going to make the change. He didn't have a royal family, so God has to stop the age of Israel. He said to Israel, I owe you 483 years, but seven are missing. The seven are going to be the seven years of the tribulation. During that time, the church will be formed, the new royal family. Hebrews 2, verse 6. But one is testified, saying somewhere, What is man that thou rememberest him? Or the son of man that thou art concerned about him? That's a quotation from Psalm 8, 4. What is man? What you see in Hebrews 2, 6. What is man that you do take thought of him? And the son of man that do, does care for him. Look at verse 7. For you have made him for a what? Notice the next phrase. Thou has made him for a little while lower than the angels. Now he's not lower than the angels. He was made for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. You've appointed him over the work of your hands. You've put all things in subjection under his feet. That is, a, of course, a reference to Psalm 8, 5 through 6, which we read, Yet thou hast made him a little lower than God, the gods. You crowned him with glory and majesty. You made him to rule over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. Notice how the Bible's clear, right to the point. However, notice what is added in Hebrews 2, 7 again. Don't miss it. For you made him for a little while. You have been made in Christ, in the nature of Christ. You have been made as a member of his body. And here it says, you've made him for a little while now, lower than the angels. Only for a little while? David never said that. Why? Because Old Testament saints were not elevated higher than angels. Because they were not in union with Christ like New Testament saints. You are in union with Christ. You are a new creature why? Because God had to make you brand new. You're not an old creature. You're a new creature. You're a new, you have a new nature. And that new nature is given throughout the word of God. Because you have a new nature, you have to have a new life. Everything's brand new because the Lord made you like that. Because of grace. No other word but because of grace. And again, because Old Testament saints were not elevated higher than the angels, they were not in union with Christ. That's why they're not like the New Testament saints. So Hebrews 2.8 says, You've put all things in subjection under his feet, for in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now, yet we do see all things subjected to him. Now we know he's got everything subjected to him. But we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than angels, verse 9, namely Jesus. Now, it doesn't say Christ, does it? It says Jesus, his humanity. Because of the suffering of death on the cross, he's crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God, he might taste death for who? For who? Everyone. They call that the doctrine of the unlimited atonement. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, the Lord, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. That would be you and me, every member of the human race. In Christ Jesus, there's neither male or female, bond or free, Jew or Gentile, you're all equal through in Christ Jesus. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, that's us, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. So because of our union with Christ and because of the ascension and the session, he ascended into heaven and he's seated at the right hand of God. Now you and I are the same. Ephesians 2, 6. He raised us up with him. When he was raised, so were we. He raised us up with him and he seated us with him. Where? In the heavenly places. So right now you may not feel like you've been raised up. You may not feel like you're, being, you're seated with him in heavenly places. The Bible says you are 
in Christ Jesus. The issue is, do you believe the Bible or do you believe what man says? Look at verse, go back to Hebrews 1, verse 13. And notice what it says here. This is all proof of what I'm saying because you'll see in the end how this really applies to us. <clears throat> Hebrews 1, 13. Mm. I don't know, I got hooked on this uh, bubbly water, and ever since then I can't drink anything else. It's holy water, I think. <laughs> Come on, you guys have a laugh to have a little bit of laughter here. You know, it's, it's the Lord's day. Another day to be alive, another day we can say thank you for all he's done. To which of the angels, verse 13, to which of the angels has he ever said, sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Has God ever said that to an angel? Never. Has he ever said that to a member of the human race? Yes. Who? Jesus Christ and us because we are in union with him. Position of truth. God the Father never said that to any angel, but only to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very significant that God the Father said this to the humanity of Christ when he was in his resurrection body. This means that although we are now inferior to angels experientially, we're inferior to them. We can't do what they can do in, the, in our human bodies on this earth. In the future, in a resurrection body, which we all have, we will be totally superior to angels. That, that's why the angels are going to have something that they have to do. Coming up in verse 14, you can see it for yourself in just a second. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand? To none of them, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. But now, we now now are now inferior to angels experientially, but in the human body on this earth, experientially, we're inferior. Someday in our resurrection body, we are going to be superior to them. And that's why concerning the angels, look at verse 14. This is why you have, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, and you're going to be very grateful if God someday shows you because you'll have the opportunity to ask him, could you show me how many times my angels, my guardian angels came through and protected me? Could you show me how many times my guardian angels came through and protected my family and were there for me when I thought no one was? Can you please show me that, Lord? And the Lord said, absolutely. But he'll let you, he'll prove it by letting you look at verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits? Who are we talking about? Angels. And what are they to do? They're sent out. They're sent out by who? God. To render service. For who? For the sake of everyone? No. But for the sake of those who will inherit what? Salvation. That is us, baby. <laughs> I'm sorry. That is us. That is us. Now, all of this is why this doctrine of the ascension and the session is the missing link between the resurrection of Christ and the Christian way of life. Something, the key here is something new had to be created to accompany this new third royalty of Jesus Christ, a new royal family. He had to have a new royal family. Now, you and I are brand new. We take it for granted. We look around, some of you, for example, I've got some teenagers now. They're looking over here. I am not over there. I've got a tendency, I'm, I'm starting to think I should put pictures of me on the walls so that when, when I'm teaching and you're looking over there, I'll be there. I can wave to you too. And, uh, you know, you might feel a little bit at home. I'm up here. You're down here. I am smart. You are not. So that's, that's the word, okay? Now, all of this is why this doctrine of the ascension and session is the missing link between the resurrection of Christ and the Christian way of life. Something new had to be created. He's, his new royalty had to be a brand new species. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ? Yes, you are. Then you are what? He is a new creature. How did you become a new creature? Well, the old things have passed away. That's your old nature. That's gone. That's dead. That died with Christ when he was on the cross. Old things have passed away. Behold, what has come? New things have what? New things have come. Why? Because you're a brand new creature. Have you been enjoying the new things that God gave you? Do you even know the new things that God has given you? Are you ignoring them? Maybe you're not ignoring them, but maybe you're ignorant of them. So what? I've been doing of a lot of the things. So what do you do? You just change your mind. 
That's what repentance is. You just change your mind. I realize now I'm a new creature. I don't care what people think about me. I care about what God thinks about me. I care about what he thinks and what he wants me to do. I don't care what people think about me or anybody else. I care about me and what God thinks about me and what my role is. And I love you people the same way that I care about myself. That's having the mind of Christ. And that's why I love 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'm a new creature. But look at Romans chapter 6, because we're given something else. If we're new creatures, well, what are we going to do as a new creature? We have to have a new type of life, don't we? We can't, live the, we can't be a new creature and then walk in the Old Testament, can we? No, not to stand, that's not a good life to live. Well, I'm born again and saved. I'm a brand new creature. Now I've got to go back to the Old Testament and sacrifice animals. It doesn't make sense. But I'm given a brand new life, and so are you. A newness of life, Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him. That's our identification with Christ. We've been buried with him through what? Baptism into his death. Notice position, no truth there. We've been buried with him. When he was buried, we were buried. Through what? Baptism or identification with his death. In order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might now walk in what kind of life? The newness of life. You will ought to wake up every morning and go, yes, another what day to be alive, another day where I can walk in the newness of life. I can't wait to tell people about the new life I have because the new man I am and because of my Lord and Savior who loved me so much, he was willing to go to the cross so much that if I was the only one that needed salvation, he would have done it just for me or just for you. Newness of life. Look at Romans 7, 6. But now we have been released from the law, thank God, the Mosaic law, having died to that by which we were bound. We used to be bound to the Old Testament so that we serve now in a newness of what? A newness of the spirit and not an oldness of the letter. What's the newness of the spirit? The new nature, the new life, not in the oldness of the letter, the old Mosaic law. Galatians 6.15 says it like this. And, uh, well, Romans 6.4 says it like this, but anyway... This is Galatians 6.15. There it is. For in Christ neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but here's what counts, a brand new what? Creation. It, and by the way, circumcision was uh, what they would fight about in the Old Testament at that time. It was like baptism, water baptism today. For neither is water baptism anything nor uh, whether you've been baptized or not anything, but having being a new cre creation, that's everything. So the issue is not whether you're circumcised or not. The issue is, are you a brand new creature? Back to here. Romans uh, 6, was it 6, 4? I read that, 7, 6. Okay. Ephesians 2, 15. This one says this. We are now called one new man by abolishing in his flesh. Look at Ephesians. I want you to see this with the eye gate, ear gate, both, your eyes and ears. Ephesians 2, 15. I want you to see we are called the one new man. Not just a new creature, we're one new man. And how? By abolishing in his flesh, Ephesians 2.15, the enmity, which is the law of the commandments that were contained in ordinances. That means we all had laws that we had broken against God, that in himself he might make the two, that's you and I, Jew and Gentile, into now one, what kind of man? One new man, thus establishing peace with God. Look at Ephesians 4, 24, where Deacon Medeiros read this. We are commanded to put on the new what? The new self. What is it called? A brand new self. Do you know the new self that you are? The Bible says we are commanded to put the new self on. Which, which and by the way, why would you want the new self? In the likeness of God it has been created. You've got a brand new nature. Do you realize that, I was telling John this, do you realize that you've got a nature that can't sin? You've got a nature that cannot sin. No, you can't sin. It's impossible. It says no one who's been born again ever sins. You say, wait a minute, I sin. No, you don't. It's not you that sins. It's the sin nature that dwells in you. You can't sin. And the Bible says why in 1 John 3, 9, it says because you're born of God and your seed, your un -new, uh, regenerated new seed cannot sin. It's impossible. And therefore, because you cannot sin, what does sin when you sin? 
It's the old nature. It's not I who sins, but the nature that's within me. So verse 24, we commanded to put on the new self, which in the likeness of God, it's been created by means of righteousness and holiness of the truth. Go back to Colossians. Look at chapter 3. Please notice again, I'm not bragging. I'm just giving you chapters and verses for a brand new subject that I've only taught on, I think, twice. <clears throat> Colossians 3, verse 9. Now you have the phrase, do not lie to one another, but it doesn't say that. It says, do not live in the lie, a reference to the lies from the cosmic system. Do not live in the lies of the cosmic system. Do not live in lies, and since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and since you have put on the, what kind of self? The new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge, by the way, epinosis is used there, metabolized doctrine, according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free men, but Christ is all and in all. In Hebrews 8.13, we are said to be part of a new covenant. 2 Peter 3, verse 13. Go there. 2 Peter 3, 13. I want you to see here we're waiting for something. Do you realize that when we wake up in the morning, we should say, you know, we do say, a lot of us say, I wish the rapture would come today. Nothing wrong with that. We should be looking for things that are new that come from God, shouldn't we? If it comes from God and it's new, I want it. I hope you do too. According to his promise, 2 Peter 3.13, Peter writes, this is the last epistle he wrote, by the way, according to his promise, God's promise, we're looking for what kind of heavens, new heavens, and what kind of earth, a new earth. Forget about this heaven and the earth. Well, the, the president's cheating us right now, and the, our Trump got a bad deal, and this is going on. Who cares? We're looking for a new heaven and a new earth. And the why in which righteousness dwells. Or oh, go to First John two. Look at verse eight. Not the epistle, but first John two. We also have a was that something that just went off? No, the cough. That was the cough? Anybody cough just then? Oh, do you need some water? Oh, can we have water for the young man, please? Like wanna give him want sparkling water, Joe? Would you like plain water? Plain water's okay. Plain water for Joe. Coming up. First John 2, verse 8. Notice that John gets it. It's his birthday today. <laughs> verse 8. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment. Please notice the new commandment. I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. And what is he writing? A brand new commandment. What does that new commandment do? That new commandment is a new way to love. It's unconditional, impersonal. And he says, I'm writing to you. I'm going to give you a brand new way of loving. Revelation 21.1 tells us that, um, well, it's not there. Go to, uh, I already took you to Ephesians 4, right? 24 and 2 Peter 3.13. There it is. Revelation 21.1. John writes this. I saw a kind of heaven, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, this heaven and earth that we're living in right now that's falling away, passing away, it passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And the reason why there's no longer any sea is the sea is the place where the doors of hell are for the angels who are being held captive. That's found in the Angelic Conflict book as well. But again, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. Revelation 21, 5. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things, what? New. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Why? Because God's making all things new. Please notice, these two doctrines of the ascension and session, they combine to form the climax of a strategic victory that Christ had in the angelic conflict of new things that you can have, a new life, 
something you can enjoy, something you can thank God for, something that you can look in the mirror and say, wow, I've got all these blessings I've been, I've been ignorant of. I'm just going to forget about my ignorance. I'm going to get right into the Word of God and learn more and more about who I am in Christ. He did all these things because he loved me. He was on the cross and he was, the Bible says, we were the joy that was set before him that kept him on the cross. That when he said, Father, I wish this cup could pass from me, he was thinking about the fact that maybe he could get away with having to die, but he said, I can't do it. Why? Because we were the joy that kept him on the cross to die for the sins of the whole world. And therefore, even while when the, uh, when the rapture had taken place, because there's people that get saved after the rapture, but even during that time, while the angels were still talking, our Lord was already in the third heaven, and they were still talking about all the things he's accomplished. When we get there, or the rapture generation, that's when the new doctrine is coming up, the big genuflex takes place, and then the whole army, the whole church gets together, and we have a party like you cannot believe. And that's something that we should all look, to, look forward to, uh, for, because he traveled billions and billions of light years in just a few seconds. And so after his ascension and his session fulfilled that prophecy, 110, the Lord God the Father said to my Lord God the Son, sit down on my right hand, shall I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? That's when the victory of Jesus Christ and his power was actually really given like never before because people began to understand it, especially the Old Testament saints and especially us when we arrive after the rapture. So his first royal title is related to his strategic victory, but that first royal title is related to his deity. His title, Son of God, his royal family, the Father and the Holy Spirit. His second royal title is related to his humanity. His title, Son of David, royal family, is the Davidic dynasty. But then the church age had to be held, and his third royal title halted. The church age had to be inserted. We call that intercalation in theology. And his third royal title is related to his resurrection and his ascension. And now his new title is King of Kings, Winner Believers, Lord of Lords, Lord, lords of the winter believers as well, bright and morning star. His royal family is in the process right now of being completed. It's called the ecclesia, the church, or the royal family of God. It's made up of every church age believer. So in closing this particular session, you are not simply a child of God. You are a royal child of God. You are somebody. Learn that you are. You're not simply a child of God. You're, you are a royal child of God. And not only that, the ascension and session is not only related to the hypostatic union, the God-man. Jesus is God. He's also man. But it's also the, related to the victory in the angelic conflict. And with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all angelic creatures, including the fallen angels, are subordinated to him in his humanity. In his deity, he's the creator of angels. In his humanity, he was made lower than angels, Hebrews 2.7. But now in resurrection, he is higher than angels in his humanity, in his human body. In his resurrection, he's now higher. Someday, in our resurrection body, we will share the same privilege experientially. We will be in union with him, and we are already positionally higher than angels. Someday, we will experience that in a unique way in our resurrection body. Ephesians 1.22 puts it like this. It says this. Well, there it is. And he, God the Father, has subordinated all angelic creatures under his feet. Furthermore, he appointed him... Jesus Christ to be ruler over all things to what? To the church. And after studying the doctrine of the ascension and the session and the descension, we're now ready for the importance of understanding the doctrine of the session in detail with a brand new doctrine called the doctrine of the big genuflex. What is that about? The big genuflex is a time when everybody's in heaven 
and even the fallen angels are going to have to get on their knees and bow their knees before the Lord and confess that he is Lord. It doesn't matter whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. It doesn't matter whether you're a fallen angel or an elect angel. You will all agree with the fact that someday every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That is the big genuflex. And that is going to happen. And so right now we're waiting for the rapture. We're enjoying these things as we're going to enjoy them more and more as time goes on and we learn more and more. Don't be familiar with God's word. It will change your life. It'll give you, it'll give you blessings that stagger the imagination. It'll bless your family. It'll bless you physically. It'll bless you mentally. It'll just get a hold of your life and make you realize what a privilege it is to be a part of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and that great and morning star, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the power of your word today. Thank you for the fact that someday we realize that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that your Son is Lord. And Father, I dedicate the closing moments to anyone who's never been born again and saved, that if they never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that I ask you right now, Father, that you reveal to them that they need to recognize that they're a sinner and that they need to recognize that they need to be saved. And as we do close these, this particular part of the service, I just ask that you just allow my daughter to come forward and wrap these things up and according to what she has received as a woman of God and uh, as someone who also loves your word, and loves to actually share these principles with the body of Christ. So bless her and her words and the remainder of this service. In the name of our Lord and Savior, we do pray. And the entire church says what? Amen. Thank you, Father.